Okay, everyone. First of all, thank you so much for being patient. Um, we figured out that the Facebook Live does not work with um, our presentations, I guess, because we can't um, share our screen and scroll through 30 pages of slides. So I I um, apologize to all of you that this takes has taken so long. So we're going to be presenting this in a um, using a different a software and then posting it on Facebook so that you'll be able to view the video. Um, and then next Friday when we do the next training, which um, I'm hoping at that point we will have um, be live or something that will definitely work with us so that we can be live and I can hear you, you can hear me. So thank you for your patience. So I wanted to share with you this, this is the beginning of a series of trainings that we're going to be doing over the next couple months. The first one being an, an, an introduction to professional parent advocacy. This is particularly for parents who um, are raising children that are involved in the mental health, juvenile justice, uh, special education, or child welfare systems. And this, what this training is predominantly used for is to, to increase a knowledge base in parents, right? is to be able to um, share with them some of their rights and responsibilities um, and educate them on the systems that serve their children and families and how they can better partner with professionals and providers in their communities and those professional providers that are working with their children and their families. So we're going to start now um, and I encourage you to um, post in the comment section if you have questions for us and either uh, myself or Zohar or Pamela or Linda will respond to them. Our definition of professional parent advocacy is one in which defines a professional parent advocate as someone who advocates for their child or their family um, and or their community with any system that serves them in a professional manner, okay? Um, that includes that we are, right? Uh, um, we are um, being assertive, we are being professional, um, we are being empowered as we sit and work with professionals and providers in the child serving arena. One of, I think, one of the basic skills um, that we should always make sure that we understand and even practice if we have to, is being able to trust and value our expertise as parents and caregivers. And the reason why I stress that is because many times in the world and uh, that we're in, Many times parents, particularly parents that have kids in the mental health and juvenile justice system, um, and also child welfare, um, we, uh, our, our skill set is not value. Our expertise as a parent is not value. Um, and so we have to be very aware not to consume that sort of um, thinking, uh, so to speak, because at the end of the day, our expertise is critical to ensuring that our children and families do well. And it is our job to educate ourselves on the system that serves our family and to become involved in those systems, but, and also to educate those professionals and providers. No one knows our children as well as we do. No one understands them as well as we do. So that's part of our role is to educate professionals and providers. The other thing is we have to understand that we, um, we have to make sure that we understand childhood mental health challenges and disabilities or emotional behavioral challenges. If in fact your child has a diagnosis, understand what the diagnosis means. Understand what childhood mental health disabilities mean, right? Take the time to not only understand your child's disabilities, but other disabilities that your child's disability may lead to. So for example, um, 
the statistics say that kids that are diagnosed with um, ADHD um, in their young adolescence, typically that will lead to some level of substance use disorder. If that's true um, for your child, make sure you understand what substance use disorder is and how it manifests itself, okay? Understand cultural competency and diversity. Understand that so that you can, again, educate professionals and providers on your culture, right? And what it means for them to be culturally competent as they work with you. And the other thing is be able to identify family-driven organizations. Those are organizations that provide opportunities for parents to become involved, right? Um, and not only involved, but also empowered um, and also allows them to take a level of ownership, right? It's this whole paradigm shift, which we're gonna talk in, about in another training, but being able to share with me, right? Being able to include me in the process, um, giving me a role in developing services. Um, that may impact my child and my family. Again, trust your expertise as a parent. Parents and caregivers have a unique knowledge and expertise. We spoke about this already. From their experience as a parent, that's critical to promoting effective and positive change in their children and the systems that serve them. Believe that to be true. I know many of you are, are reading that and saying, yeah, okay believe that to be absolutely true. People who are most impacted by systems are the people who understand how to reform the system the best. It can't be done without them, it can't. If it is, if it is done, I mean, um, unfortunately the, you know, we don't fare as well, but ultimately in order to reform anything or in order to get any system as close, you know, to um, as close to the system as possible, as, as close to perfection as possible, the people who are in the system have to be involved. So, so far we have to value our expertise as parents, value our experience, right? Two different things. Expertise and experience are two different things. Recognize that we know our child better than the professionals that serve them. Even though I may be a behaviorist or a psychologist, um, and I've gone through all that training, that, that, that prepares me to work with children, but that doesn't necessarily say that I know this particular child that has this particular di diagnosis better than his parents. Because my understanding, let's say, as someone coming, as, as a practitioner, is academic, right? It's, it's book learning. And I'm not devaluing that. But what I'm saying is that that's a piece of the pie of the ultimate treatment that, you know, that is best for my child. That's a piece. The other piece is my experience and my expertise. Recognize that you are in a position to teach. You're a teacher too, not just to your children, but to the people who provide services to your child. Recognize again, you're gonna to have to educate professionals on your culture, how your culture impacts your family, and ultimately the care that your child receives. And understand that this knowledge is critical to your child's well-being. If you really wanna improve outcomes, for your children and your family, strengthen your knowledge base as a parent. Okay, we're gonna look at one particular, I believe this is the training that we did in the city of Patterson. So if you notice, for every city that we've done the training in, we will talk about the demographics based on that city. So I think the last time we did this, um, which it didn't actually, it didn't tape as well, we were talking, we were in the city of Elizabeth. So this time um, I've chosen the city of Patterson. Their total population is about 150,000, right? Child population is 44 plus. And then it talks about the child population by race. These are things you should know. You should definitely know the first three. Uh, the rest of them 
if you're involved in the child welfare system, you might want to know those things as well. Um, you want to know about the percent of children under 18 living below poverty in your community. You might want to know you you, you might want to know uh, the child and uh, the number of child abuse and neglect referrals, um, the percentage of of children in your community that are African American or Latino or Caucasian, right? You may want to know those things too. Those are all important as you educate yourself on your community. In the city of Patterson, the, Mar the Montclair State University, they did a um, youth survey. And I'm going to share a couple of things with you because I think they're important. Another example of, of um, issues that are important and information that's important for you to know as a parent or a family member as you advocate. Um, this particular study, they studied 648 students in the fifth, seventh, and ninth through 12th grades. Their risk factors, right? These were risk factors for the children. There was a lack of support network from school staff. This is how the kids felt. It says children felt there was little support from individuals such as guidance counselors, teachers, and principals. There were feelings of inadequacy by these kids. There was a prevalence of victimization in school. Children reported being physically threatened and harmed by other students. Now, on the other hand, the protective factors in the, in the school, um, in the city, was that finishing school was important to over 80% of children and their parents. Over 50% of kids reported mostly A's and B's. Special education students were more prone to duplicate these statistics without the proper services. Over 75% of children felt college was important. So those are some of the protective factors, right? As we think about the risk factors. If you're a parent in, in this community, what you want to do is, is, is definitely think about increasing your protective factors and decreasing the risk factors. So what can we do about the first bullet? You know, what can we do about the lack of support network from school staff? There are things we can do about that. Those are meetings with the school professionals, um, with the district folks, you know, um, whatever it may be, the superintendent, teachers, et cetera, board of education, okay? The victimization as well. Maybe that's a meeting with the youth services commissioner as well, or you want to meet with the local police department, okay? In the family domain, some of the risk factors included paternal involvement. Kids felt that parents played, a, uh, fathers played a less active role in their children's life. Over one third of children felt that. Verbal conflict among family members, physical conflict among family members and feelings of inadequacy within the home. 20% of children felt that no one paid attention to them and that no one wanted them at home. Some of the protective factors included maternal involvement. Over 80% of children found their mothers to be an important source of help and support. Over 80%, okay? That's something, that's, that's a, a great, um, uh, issue to keep in mind when we're thinking about foster care and the child welfare system. A sense of self-worth from family members was a protective. Over 80% report their parents were proud of them and family members to feel very close to, okay? Like to spend time with and seek help from each other. Over 60% said that their family members ask each other for help. So those are some of the protective factors in the family domain. In that youth survey that was done, 10% of children expressed they wanted to become a gang member, and 10% were already gang members. That's also something to think about. In the community, only 48% of the kids passed grade 11, compared to the state rate of 79%. 57% of grade four passed their assessments compared to 81% of the state rate. 
50% of Patterson's children graduate compared to the state graduation rate of 84%. In comparison to other cities, Patterson like other cities, their children and youth are at risk of educational failure, dropping out of school, juvenile delinquency, drug use, gang involvement, and I should say in comparison to other at-risk communities. I wanted to make sure I'm stressing that. Risky sexual behavior lacks strong positive role models. One of the things as parent advocates we have to be aware of are the resources in the community. The places to go for help. The places to ensure um, they are providing help. First of all is the, the county superintendent. I think a lot of times parents, we forget about that. We have a county superintendent. We have a superintendent, but we also have a county superintendent. The County Department of Human Services, the Youth Services Commission, Division of Child Behavioral Health, um, the DCPMP system in New Jersey, our child welfare system, develop, developmental disabilities, the superintendent of the school district. Um, in addition, there's a bunch of assistant, uh, of an array of assistant superintendents in Patterson, uh, the Board of Ed members, PTA, teachers, counselors, and other nonprofit organizations that, sell, um, that serve families and youth in Patterson. As we get to know those folks, what we want to do is we want to find out from them um, the boards that they have, the councils that they have, and commissions. And then we want to know what role can I as a parent play in these systems? What role can I play in the on the boards in the mental health system? Well, in Passaic County, you have a system of care, right? You have the um, CMO and the FSO, both of those care management organization, family support organization, both of those organizations have boards and that have to have a certain percentage of parents and caregivers on those boards. Child welfare has local district offices in your community, youth services commission, you can go to those meetings, ask them, be on their commissions and boards the DDD Family Council as well. In education, we have the Parent Information Centers, we have Parent Alliances and Parent Advisory Boards. So all of those are opportunities for parents to play a strong and active role in the services that their children receive. Understand cultural competency. Make sure that you understand that. Uh, here is a definition of cultural competency, competency that we borrowed from Georgetown, and we've tweaked it a little bit. Um, so we put together a definition of, as it relates to an individual, it's the foundation comprised of experiences by which human beings view, interact, and respond to the world. This foundation is both individual, familial, institutional, societal, and it includes thoughts, your communications, your actions, your customs, your beliefs, your values, your religion, and your ethnicity. All of these things form the foundation as it relates to cultural competency. Pretty much, if, when we sum it up, it's the way in which we view the world. And all of these things impact the way in which we view the world. Cultural competency refers to an ability to interact with people of different cultures. There's four components. Being aware of your own cultural worldview, your attitudes towards cultural differences, your knowledge of different cultural practices and worldviews, and cross-cultural skills. Developing cultural competence results in an ability to understand, communicate with, and effectively interact with people across cultures. That is the goal. That is the goal. That is the goal not only for you as a parent and an advocate, but that is the goal for the people who work with your children and your family. That is the goal of their organizations, okay? 
Um, and if it's not, it's you again, you have to educate people that are working with your family on cultural competence or the lack thereof. So for example, you're not going to become culturally competent by going to a two day class. It's not gonna happen. It's not, it's work, it's work. Think about these four components that are listed here. This is work for many people, okay? Ultimately though, the goal is to, right? improve outcomes for children and families. So if you keep that goal in mind, it won't be a problem. One of the interesting, um, interesting sort of things about cultural competency is, and I, I remember this from years ago, is Dr. Carl Jung, he was a psychoanalyst, and he worked under Sigmund Freud, Dr. Freud. Um, and he defined cultural archetypes as an archetype that is an unlearned tendency to experience things in a certain way. So he felt that we are born with these cultural archetypes. And it is first through interactions with caregivers and then by relationships that we develop these neural networks from the moment we're born. So what you want to think about is how does culture impact your parenting? How does it impact your family? How does culture impact your child's education? How does it shape your vision of the systems that serve your family? Do you, do you think that you see a particular system, for example, do you see as, as an African-American parent, do you see the special education system differently than a Caucasian parent? Or as a Latino parent, do you see the child welfare system differently than the education system? All right, so think about how your culture shapes your vision. Again, the way in which you view the world and think about that. The next thing is under ch understanding childhood challenges. Okay, one of the one of the interesting things is that in being able to be the best advocate that you can be, um, I think in many ways, the process of educating yourself puts you in puts you in a puts you in an amazing sort of position as you move outside of advocating for your child and sort of embrace advocating for your community. It really opens up, up a, uh, a world of doors for you, so to speak. One of the things that, um, one of the things that we do as part of this training is we go through and teach parents on the, all of the behavioral, health issues um, or mental health challenges that children may be diagnosed with. And, um, and in addition, we also go through the DSM-5 now, right? So previously four. And so one of the things that I wanted to just talk about briefly is that there is a prevalence of childhood mental health challenges in at-risk communities. And some of those include what was referred to in the DSM-4 as disruptive disorders. Those would be contact disorders, conduct disorders, um, ADHD, attention uh, deficit hyperactivity disorder, uh, ODD, oppositional defiant disorder. Another one that's, another disability that's prevalent in at-risk communities of post-traumatic stress disorder and learning disabilities as well. And in the training, we have an entire day where we go through all of the childhood mental health challenges and the presenting features of them as well. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is there is a correlation between certain childhood mental health challenges, obviously, and the environment. 
and genetics. So that's something that we have to take into consideration as well. And the final thing is identifying other um, organis other family or uh, family driven organizations that you can be come involved in. And um, the uh, definition of family driven that was developed by the Federation of Families of Children's Mental Health in DC is the definition that's here on the slide. And it means that family members have a primary decision making role in the care of their own children as well as the policies and procedures governing care for all children in their community, state, tribe, territory, and nation. Now, this includes choosing support services and providers, setting goals, designing and implementing programs, monitoring outcomes. And this is a partial list, really, because I believe that the list goes on and on, partnering and funding decisions. But that's what it means for a organization to be family driven is that parents and family members are involved on all levels of decision making and i just mentioned that and there's a slide for that um, and at the, in addition uh, a family driven organization is also governed and staffed by family members so you'll see parents and family members on their boards right um, and the commissions within uh, a family-driven organization. What services do they offer? They offer everything from information and referral to support to other family organizations. And I'm gonna go through them uh, pretty quickly. One of the first one is information and referral. So that's information about, you know, such things as uh, uh, mental health providers in the community, um, where can I go to for outpatient services? So they may call in and, and they're, or they're looking for a psychiatrist for their son or daughter that's been recently diagnosed. And um, they may be looking for a community resource for their child, um, one that works with um, you know, kids that have special needs. It could be a, a school in the district that could be an out of district placement. So there's an array of things that parents and youth and their fa family members will call in about. Peer support groups is another service that's offered by um, family driven organizations. And that could be a support group that's facilitated by a youth who's been impacted, like a, a youth that has a mental health challenge or a youth that's been involved, you know, in, in the juvenile justice or any of the other systems, and it is also facilitated by them. So it's not just a, support, a peer support group that's um, run by a professional or a provider. Like our, our support groups are run by the people who are most impacted by that. Um, and that's what's important that they can actively participate in the care that they're receiving. Um, the other thing is because they're most impacted by it, those are the people that should be facilitating those groups. They should be in a position of power when it comes to support groups and, and uh, decision making, all the things that we pointed out in Family Driven. Cross-system advocacy means that, you know, uh, as an advocate, you have training in all the child serving systems. So you can um, advocate for a child that, let's say, is involved in the child welfare and special education system. And you may have to go to court with them or a treatment team meeting or an IEP meeting. Um, you're going to work with the family to develop a family advocacy plan. So that's what a cross-system advocate or, or cross-system advocacy means. Some of the goals of our trainings include strengthening parents' knowledge of the systems that serve them and their rights and responsibilities in those systems. Another, uh, another goal is, is to ensure better access to appropriate care and treatment for children. That's one of the struggles that I think we have as a state throughout this country is that uh, increasing access is difficult. Ensuring better access is, is difficult. Um, because what happens is while there may be tons of services out there, many times parents don't know about that. So increasing access is, is typically something that is usually at the top of everybody's list. 
Um, one of the things we're aware of is that, you know, one in five children have a diagnosable mental health disability. So what you want to do is look at the number of kids that are served in your community. If you know the population of children, you can figure out what number that should be. And many times, we're not serving the number of children that are suffering the most. We are not. And that's why we get kids who are now get into high school um, and have a diagnosis all of a sudden, or they, or they get into, you know, they get to a certain age and now they're, they're incarcerated or they're arrested for a particular behavior that maybe something happened in school and there was an incident. That's where the school to prison pipeline starts at. And, and they were sent to, uh, you know, they were arrested and charged. And now they and their family is standing before a judge in superior court. So it's, it's important that we have an understanding of what's available in our community and that we know that we have the power to change that if there needs to be additional um, information and supports and services. This is some of the curriculum that we have. So the different training programs that we have for parents. Um, in addition to the professional parent advocacy, we have um, strengthening, family strengthening strategies for at-risk communities you know, collaborating with agencies dedicated to children's health, et cetera. And you can see a lot of this information on our website. Direct services programs. We only provide one direct service program and that's where we work directly with the children because um, typically, and, and I'm talking about children under the age of 18 um, because we do have a youth caucus and they are, um, but the, the, uh, our youth caucus members, they are over the age of 18, but we only have one program where we work with children under the age of 18, and that would be the Strengthening Families program. The other thing is educating and influencing policymakers. Um, so, for example, family members might testify at legislative hearings. They might meet with a legislator, le legislator about a particular bill. Um, they, you know, they might meet with them to let them know about what's going on in their community, the lack of psychiatrists, the lack of um, outpatient services, etc. Evaluation is critical. Anytime you um, are, have to, are taking part in a particular program, you always want to make sure you ask them, um, do they have any evaluation data about the strength of the program, the impact of the program? So it can't just be that, oh, the program is great and wonderful. It has to be, what is the impact like? How has it changed me, my child and my family? Not, oh, it's a good program, you know? Um, how has it changed them? So always ask those questions. The last thing is support the local family run organizations. And oh, even before I say that, I wanted to point out on the last slide when we talked about evaluations, families being involved in the evaluation process is critical. Um, and particularly when you're administering surveys and things like that, because parents talk to parents the best. Okay, so I think it's important to include them in that process, get them to des design the surveys. Um, get them to figure out how best to implement them in the local community, okay? And then finally, supporting other family-run organizations. Some are, some are smaller organizations. Um, and so one of the things about um, professional parent advocacy is knowing who they are and working with them um, to help them strengthen this, their capacity and the services that they offer. Finally, volunteer and paid opportunities for family members. That's another thing that family-driven organizations offer. Uh, always a volunteer opportunities um, for them to bring any of their ideas to fruition. And also paid employment opportunities as well. Okay, so that concludes the um, professional parent advocacy training.
And again, I apologize for us having such a difficult start. Next Friday, we will be um, providing a training on navigating the juvenile justice system in New Jersey. Uh, so I encourage you to participate. By that time, we should have all the kinks worked out. And um, I hope to hear from you soon. Thanks so much for joining us.